The 1600s was a time of uncertainty. There was always something to be afraid of, and the intimidating vigilance the residents of the communities held over one another didn't quite give the safe and secure effect it was meant to. For the women of the time, they had to be extra precautious. They were the ones who were watched the most, and for one particular woman who lived in the community of Hadley, Massachusetts, the accusations she faced and punished dealt onto her may have turned her into the very thing her accusers feared the most. Join me in this episode as we delve into the life of the Witch of Hadley. Welcome back to Moonlight Lore. As always, I'm your host, Jordan Hopkins. As quickly established as it was, New England in the 1600s was a place of unpredictability for many people. While industries like fishing, farming, and lumbering prospered greatly in the new land, to the individuals living and tending to it, they faced an immense deal of hardship. It was a time when religion had its cruel hand wrapped around the throats of every person trying to start a new life. It was a time when the idea that demons, devils, and witches were very real threats and were living among your neighbors' homes and families, waiting to reveal themselves in malicious and tempting ways. Growing suspicion of these nefarious three continued to grow up to and beyond what everyone knows were the events of the Salem Witch Trials. But what many people don't typically focus on are the slowly approaching signs that people, even to this day, grow desperate when they're faced with fear. If we are to properly understand the tragic events leading up to the case of the Hadley Witch, we need to understand her beginnings. Her name was Mary Reeve, and was born in England sometime around 1624, but eventually immigrated with her family to Springfield when she was still quite young. They were never really wealthy, but they made a decent living. Mary, however, wasn't content with this way of life. She craved more when she saw how the wealthier people in town lived, and she grew envious while growing up. At a young age, Mary was different than most girls. For the time, she exhibited habits some would have said were unfitting of a young woman, and with being loudly outspoken, rebellious, and a little rough around the edges, she quickly earned the reputation for being a woman who caused trouble wherever she went. But this didn't bother her so much. No matter how many lectures given to her by her father and mother, she still only wanted a life she could be happy with. A life where she could live by her own rules, and not conform to the rules of the society at the time. So, as one could expect, she wasn't satisfied with toiling in the fields with her family for the rest of her life. She wanted something more. And at the age of 46 in the year 1670, she married a man by the name of William Webster and moved just a few short miles north, just outside the small town of Hadley, where the two hoped they would get a fresh start. It's here they would struggle for years to build the life they both desperately wanted, having resorted to living in a small shack just off the side of a dirt highway and accepting donations from the town to help make ends meet and to put food on the table. Despite William Webster coming from a prominent family, his father being a former governor and he and his brother owning multiple plots of land, his finances unfortunately fell into disarray. They lost their property and were forced to move into what was at the time considered a small townhouse next to a small meadow. Needless to say, living in this poverty with no sign of escaping didn't ease Mary's resentment towards the rest of the world and many of her wealthier neighbors. Her burning temper only grew with time, and her viciously sharp words became legendary to the citizens of Hadley who had the occasional displeasure of interacting with her. Most would end up going out of their way to avoid her completely, consequentially casting her social standing even lower, and further into becoming an outcast of the community. Mm -hmm. 
As we know from the events of the Salem Witch Trials in the 1690s, it didn't take much for whispers to quickly spread of someone practicing witchcraft. For the women of the time, they were judged on everything they did. If they were too free-spirited, witch. If they didn't fall in line and respect the rules, witch or if they exhibited any of the personality traits Mary Webster was often known to express, which. With her fiery temper and hatred for the rest of the world being the defining features most of the community of Hadley would know her as, along with her declining social status and living in isolation outside of town near the woods, suspicion towards her continued to grow, and it wasn't long before quiet whispers began to sprout up in town that Mary Webster had been dealing with the devil. This, of course, was more than likely not true, but it doesn't matter now. What only mattered was what people of the time believed, and they believed Mary was a witch who was out to get them. Unfounded testimonies tell of those traveling on the highway near her house would occasionally experience troubles getting past once they neared her secluded home. For those traveling by horse and carriage, or were attempting to lead cattle to another field to graze in, they oftentimes found their animals refused to go anywhere near Mary Webster's home. So rumors started to spread that the old lady living near the woods had bewitched the animals so that they were unable to pass by the home. So in response to hearing these rumors, those who would travel along the highway and experience trouble in getting their stubborn animals to move would oftentimes pay a visit to Mary's home where they would barge through the front door and methodically beat her. According to many of these violent thugs, after giving Mary a thorough battering, their horses or cattle would then easily and freely pass by her home without issue, strengthening the belief that Mary was indeed a witch and strengthening Mary's hatred for the rest of society. Who could really blame her though? For years she was handed the short end of the stick in life and her unhidden resentment towards her community would continue to grow. With word on the street continuing to spread about the supposed Witch of Hadley, there were a number of men of faith in the community who found this rather offensive. Not offensive for the fact that the unfounded rumors had been spreading, but more so because a supposed witch was there poisoning their town. Enter a man by the name of Philip Smith. Deacon of the Hadley Church, Lieutenant of the local garrison of troops, Justice to the County Court, Member of the General Court, and man of incredible devotion, sanctity, and honesty. He was considered one of the most prominent figures in all of Hadley, and as expected, arch nemesis to Mary Webster. He made it his mission to confirm the suspicions surrounding Mary and went to great lengths to do so. Aside from constant verbal assaults he and his lackeys would dish out towards Mary when she made the occasional trip into town, we could also expect he had more than likely paid her a few visits in the dead of night to threaten or beat her viciously, all in the name of his faith. Though despite his disapproval and longing to be rid of her, he was smart enough to know he needed actual proof this woman living outside of town was indeed a witch. His prayers would soon be answered, when a story began circulating through town that pointed towards Mary as being the culprit. According to some, while preparing a meal for the evening, a chicken had flown down the chimney and landed in the boiling pot of water placed above the roaring fire. As the chicken landed in the bubbling water, it thrashed around and flew out one of the open windows of the house, and then ran down the road making an awful noise. Now at the time, this might not have seemed like much of an indication a witch was behind this, but a few days later it was noticed that Mary had a few burns on her body, which then fueled Smith and his men's suspicion that Mary had been using a familiar or had even transformed herself into the chicken in order to watch and spy on her neighbors. This is of course very ridiculous, but this was the evidence Philip Smith was desperately waiting for. He, along with much of the town, used the burn found on Mary's body as evidence, concluding that the burn was a witch's mark, also known as the devil's mark. Now for those of you who might not know what that is, it's a permanent marking on the skin of a woman made by the devil himself, supposedly who would oftentimes place the mark to signify the obedience and allegiance to him. This could be a number of things depending on what suited the accusers best. It could have been a large mole, warts, birthmark, or in Mary's case, intense burns. But these people believed these were proof someone had dealings with the devil, and their fate would often be sealed by those accusing them. <laughs> <laughs> 
With the continuous stories of possible witchcraft making its rounds through every home in Hadley, along with what every citizen there considered unpleasant behavior from Mary, it wasn't long before she was forced to face and contest the rumors presented by her accusers. Since Philip Smith was a member of the county court magistrates on Northampton, he saw to it that Mary was, in his eyes, brought to justice. So, on March 27th of 1683, she was brought to court under suspicion of witchcraft. According to the record of the trial, Mary, wife of William Webster of Hadley, being under strong suspicion of having familiarity with the devil or using witchcraft, had many testimonies brought in against her, or that did seem to center upon her, relating to such a thing. But instead of sentencing her right there, they actually had her transported to Boston in early April to face indictment in the court of assistance. And it's here she would stay, waiting in a filthy prison cell for her time to finally come. Back at the town of Hadley, Philip Smith, along with members of the church and most of the community, were celebrating the fact they had finally gotten rid of the woman who terrorized their small town for years. In those days, once a woman was sent off for judgment, there was very little chance of ever seeing her again. So they were excited, happy to have played a role in removing evil from their town and enjoying the peace they so desperately longed for. Months would pass by while Mary anxiously awaited trial in her prison cell. Eventually her time came and she hesitantly was brought forth before the court of Boston. Records of the court say Mary Webster was now called and brought to the bar and was indicted, to which indictment she pleaded not guilty, making no exception against any of the jury, leaving herself to be tried by God in the country. The indictment and evidences in the case were read and committed by the jury, and the jury brought in their verdict that they found her not guilty. Mary was free. I like to imagine the shock and horror plastered on the faces of the citizens of Hadley, and the beet red face on Philip Smith's when Mary rode proudly back into town as a free woman. As you could imagine, the residents were less than thrilled with the court's ruling, and held just as much resentment towards her as much as Mary held a grudge against them. They tried using the law to their advantage, and they failed. There were some who accepted the decision of the court, but there were far more who were skeptical and wholly disagreed. Philip Smith, most of all. He was furious his plan to evict Mary from the community didn't work, and the two continued their feud. But maybe not in the way one would typically believe. You see, things in Hadley remained relatively quiet for quite some time. Perhaps some had come to terms with the court's decision and finally accepted Mary was innocent of her crimes. Others maybe just grew tired for the quest of religious justice against a lonely, poverty-stricken woman. They may have believed she just wasn't worth the trouble anymore. But Smith, he never quit his campaign against Mary when it came to belittling or harassing her. And Mary was a strong, stubborn woman who now knew she could shake the system. It wasn't until a year and a half later did their feud finally escalate from exchanges of harsh words into a deadly rivalry. On a cold, bitter day in early January of 1685, Philip Smith collapsed unexpectedly. A strange sickness had befallen him, and even with the help of the local practitioner, they struggled to find relief. Of course, many suspected Mary was the culprit for inflicting the man with this strange illness, but there was zero proof. No sign of witchcraft being used, no traces of poison, nothing. So everyone had to pray and wait, hoping Smith would overcome whatever it was that ailed him. But when signs of the supernatural started to make an appearance, growing suspicion towards Mary began to escalate like it once had before. Crying out in pain, Smith would often shout out for forgiveness from his God, pleading to end the suffering he was cursed with. He would often yell, writhing in bed, Lord, stay thy hand. It is enough. It is more than thy frail servant can even bear. In between the moments when he would try to rest or scream out in pain, in labored breath he would whisper, 
It was Mary who had cursed him. The Witch of Hadley was trying to kill him. But those tending to him believed him to be delirious. He and Mary hadn't had an interaction in days, and surely this woman, who was acquitted of the crime of witchcraft, couldn't have played any role in Smith's illness. But as the days went on and the man's illness failed to get any better, those surrounding Smith started to become more and more convinced. At first, it didn't seem like anything. Smith would often yell out that he would feel like someone had been pricking his back with needles, and then when checked, his back did appear to have small red spots all over it, though this could have been chalked up to the strange illness. But when red spots started to appear right in front of everyone's eyes, it began to cause quite a stir in the small house. While trying to administer vials of medicine from a nearby shelf, those who would reach for them found each were completely empty despite being used just a few minutes ago. Then while those tending to Smith finally had a moment's rest and Smith himself was fast asleep, those surrounding his bed swore they saw something moving beneath the sheets. Perhaps thinking it was a small cat or something of the like, they threw the bed sheet off of Smith, yet there was nothing underneath. As they covered the sick man once more, the strange rustling under the covers appeared again, and no matter how many times it was reached for and grabbed at, it couldn't be caught. Of course, the suspicion that this was one of Mary's familiars crossed the minds of everyone there, but perhaps they were just nervous to admit it, that the witch really did possess these strange powers. Smith awoke once more, writhing, clutching his head and screaming out in pain, and this was the worst they'd seen him, so it was enough to cause some of the men there to investigate. All but one departed Smith's house, and marched out of town towards the little old shack where the witch lived. Slamming their fists against the door, it slowly opened as Mary stood in the entranceway, furious at this disruption. Without hesitation, the intruders questioned her and burst right through her front door. They then turned her home upside down in search of anything that might incriminate her into being guilty in causing Philip Smith's illness. They searched for a short ten minutes as Mary stood scowling in her doorway, demanding the men leave her home. And as they failed to find anything they could use against her, they left with an ominous warning they would be returning if Philip's condition didn't improve. Reportedly upon reaching Smith's house, the single man left behind said while they were away, for about 10 minutes Smith seemed to have calmed down and the illness inflicting him seemed to have vanished. But as soon as the group of men returned, he began wrenching in pain again. They quickly went on to care for him once more, but just mere seconds after sitting down, the group witnessed something none of them would have believed if they hadn't seen it with their own eyes. At the foot of the bed, just below Smith's feet, a ball of fire mysteriously appeared out of thin air and began burning away the blanket draped over him. Before the men could react or even speak of the flame, it disappeared. But they all saw it, and they were sure of it. Suspicion grew fast, and the group of men decided in that small house in the middle of winter, Mary Webster, the Witch of Hadley, needed to die. As Mary continued about her business in her home, tidying up the dismay the intruders caused her just an hour ago, another knock came at her door, though this one was a lot less aggressive than before. Perhaps she expected someone else to be on the other side of the wooden door, someone far more calmer, who would treat her with a little more respect than her last visitors, but she was woefully mistaken. As she slowly unlocked the door and opened it, she was met with a strong, dirty fist right to the face. She fell backwards into her home and with blurry eyes looked up to see the same posse who had visited her just an hour before. Smith's friends looked down upon her with a horrifying look in their eyes, eyes that shared one common goal. Mary struggled to lift herself up off the ground, but before she even could, the men grabbed her ankles and dragged her outside screaming. It's there, they beat her each man taking turns kicking her in the head and wailing on her body. 
It's not clear how long she endured this punishment, but I could only imagine it lasted quite some time considering the group's grudge against her. Once every man had their fill of violence, they dragged her bloody, nearly unconscious body towards a nearby tree. They flung a rope high into one of its branches and hastily fashioned a strong noose. Lifting her up by the arms, the men placed the noose firmly around Mary's neck and held her in place. Reading out a prayer from one of their Bibles, the men holding Mary by her arms then let go while another man began hoisting her up by pulling on the rope. Life in Mary swiftly rushed back into her the moment she felt her feet leave the ground. With her hands struggling to break free, she grasped at the rope now tightly gripping her neck, slowly constricting her breath and choking her to death. It surprisingly took a while for Mary to finally take her last breath, but the group of men surrounding her stayed to watch with satisfaction as they had finally rid the world of one more witch. Breaking off a piece of wood from the tree and jabbing Mary in the stomach with it, one of the men ensured she had truly passed and cut the rope that held her dangling in the air. Her body quickly fell with a thud against the frozen ground, and in a manner they believed fitting for a witch, they promptly buried her underneath the frozen ground in the snow, under the very tree that helped kill her. They hoped by killing her, the spell she had casted over Smith, causing his illness, would cease. However, when they returned to his house, they were discouraged to find he still suffered from the affliction. Day after day, he cried out in pain, and those passing by his home would often hear his loud pleas for relief go unanswered. Until one day, just a few short days after Mary was murdered by Smith's posse, those passing by his home realized it was eerily silent. A crowd quickly gathered around his home and awaited news from his caretakers and friends. Philip Smith, deacon of the Hadley Church, member of the courts and prominent character of town, succumbed to his illness on a calm Wednesday morning in January. The town mourned over the loss of their beloved friend and cursed Mary's name for taking him. Despite her being acquitted of being a witch from the courts, the citizens of Hadley were convinced she had been practicing witchcraft that led to the death of Philip Smith. Now, most would believe this story is at an end, with the two main characters of it now dead and buried in the ground. Most would think that, but the reality was, only one of our main characters died that January, back in 1685. You see, when the group of Smith's friends beat, hung, then buried Mary in the ground under that old tree outside her house, they neglected to thoroughly check that she had in fact died. Maybe if they had, they would have discovered she was still clinging onto life. Moments after the men left her body in the ground to rot, a bloody hand burst from the ground and began digging the rest of itself out of the frozen earth. Mary, despite suffering from multiple broken bones, being hung from a tree until the edge of death and buried alive under the freezing snow and dirt, had managed to do the impossible. She survived, and not just for a few days or weeks. No, she lived on for another 11 years after when she was supposed to have died. It may have taken her some time to recover after dragging herself back to her home and healing, but she did manage to make a full recovery. If you thought the shocked faces on the townsfolk were something when she returned to town after beating the courts, just imagine the surprise and terror they must have felt as they watched an angry, dead woman walk back into town. No doubt, people were afraid of her and her unnatural ability to stay alive. They kept as much distance from her as possible from that point on, but surely they still persecuted her every chance they got. Though Mary did end up living a full life, up well into her 70s in the year of 1696, where she presumably died in peace, surviving well past the events of the Salem Witch Trials in 1692, undoubtedly concerning everyone in Hadley on if Mary could be killed at all. She proved to be an incredibly resilient woman who refused to break under the punishment and misogyny dealt onto her. After her death, those who remembered her called her by another name, Half-Hanged Mary. And one of her descendants who was so inspired by her story took it upon herself to honor her every chance she got. Famous Canadian author Margaret Atwood 
who dedicated her incredibly well-known novel, The Handmaid's Tale, to Mary, also wrote a short poem about her ordeal and persecution. When they came to harvest my corpse, open your mouth, close your eyes, cut my body from the rope, surprise, surprise, I was still alive. Tough luck, folks. I know the law. You can't execute me twice for the same thing. How nice. I fell to the clover, breathed it in, and barred my teeth at them in a filthy grin. You can't imagine how that went over. Now I only need to look at them through my sky blue eyes. They see their own ill will staring them in the forehead and turn tail. Before, I was not a witch, but now I am one. Thank you all for listening to this episode about an extraordinary woman who stood up against the men who tried and failed to get their way. Fittingly, her life, along with her story, lasted longer than those who abused their power and authority. If you enjoyed listening to this episode and are looking to hear more, feel free to follow or subscribe on whatever app you're listening on. If you also have a free moment, consider leaving a 5-star review on iTunes and now also Spotify. They just released a rating system on their app, and I would be incredibly appreciative if you left a five-star review there as well. It only takes a second, and it goes a long way to helping the podcast grow. Another way you can support the show is by sharing it with your friends and family. The more people listen, the more the show climbs the podcast charts. It's the best way for any show to grow, so if you have anyone in your life who you think might be interested, send them on over. The show also has a brand new website and Patreon. By typing in MoonlightLore.com on your web browser, you can find information about myself, the show, news, updates, the whole episode archive, a photo gallery, and a way to contact me if you so choose. There's also a link to a new Patreon there as well. If you have the means to do so, the best way to support the show now is by donating there. For only just $5 a month, you can help the show and help cover the costs of the upkeep of it. If at any time you wish to contact me, just feel free to reach out on my email at moonlightlordpodcast at gmail.com or on Instagram at moonlightlordpodcast. But for now, I believe that's it. So as always, take care of yourselves and thank you for listening. I'll see you next time.